Auto Tools doesn't stop you from writing software. What it does is it helps you get your software into different operating systems in an easier way. And what I mean by that is you can take a software program and you can put it on a website and people can download that program and just run it. They absolutely could do that, right? And if it's a very simple program that has one program file, one executable program file, then yeah, that's that's pretty that would be a pretty neat way to deploy a program. However, many programs in a Linux environment are not deployed that way. And I would dare say the vast majority of them, especially in the Debian branch, are deployed through a package management system. Red Hat based Linux distributions also work that way. And so you take your program and let's say it's, it's comprised of multiple files, which a pretty decently developed program um, is, going to, is going to be composed that way. And a package management uh, deployment is going to be the most straightforward and streamlined way to distribute that software. And so in order to have your software distributed through a package management system, it's very useful and it's, it works to your benefit to have the software meet the standards of that package management system. And so that's where AutoTools comes into play because AutoTools itself is not recognized directly by package management systems. These package management systems have their own file format for how you take a software program, put it into a package, and then that package is released into the computer system, into the operating environment, right? But when I was building the packages by hand, right, I did a thorough study of the Red Hat package management system and the Debian package management system and packaging formats. And it took me many days and many hours to put together a package that could be recognized by these environments. And so what I did was I said, okay, I noticed something here. I noticed some similarities between the two package systems, between Red Hat package management system, RPM, and Debian, uh, Deb. So the RPM files and the Deb files, they are different, but their overall approach is very similar. As I dug deeper into it, right, I completed my packages. I, I, I got my packages together. But I noticed that many of the workarounds or the clever techniques that I came up with could all have been set aside if I had used auto tools. Because you see, auto tools defines a standard for how software is installed and uninstalled, right? So software is installed and it's uninstalled. Or you do an update to a program and there's a standard way to do the update, right? And so the package, it, all it's going to do is execute a sequence of steps based on the standards and procedures established by the respective package system, package management system. And so when you use auto tools, then what happens is you don't have to do all these these uh, clever workarounds and these these clever scripts and setups to make the package just work, right? All you have to do is have a auto tools compatible build uh, for your software, and then the package management uh, process 
the, the process of putting a package together where all the software is now encoded in a package that can be installed on a person's system, that becomes more straightforward. So instead of taking, you know, um, hours, maybe days to put together a package and you're constantly having to tweak this or tweak that, right, in order to get it to work, if you're able to follow the auto tools process more in a more straightforward way, then your whole process of setting up the package becomes easier. So that was the big picture for me to pick up auto tools is so that the composition and the creation of these packages is done in a more professional way. That's it. So tonight is my first attempt at integrating auto tools with the software that I've been writing for several years, right? And so I'm going to take the software that I wrote and I'm going to make a copy of it into a new directory, right? Because I'm going to leave the, the existing version as it is, right? It's going to remain as it is. And so I want a clean slate in terms of reworking the file structure because the code isn't going to change. The code is going to be the same. The code is fine. But how that code is packaged is what I want to improve. And so the sequences that follow will show my initial attempts based off of my reading of the GNU Auto Tools book, right, um, by John Calcote. And I will be referring to this book as I go along and make sure I am doing the right steps in integrating Auto Tools into my software project. So the rest of these sequences are going to be pretty straightforward and I'm going to talk somewhat rapidly through them. You can always pause um, if you need and rewind if you needed to uh, you know try to connect with what I'm, I'm saying but I hope that um, this is a good uh, revealing uh, exercise in how auto tools works when setting up a software project uh, from the ground up. Let's start with running the current version of the Gaucher RSS Reader, version 7. I had recently got it to compile on Fedora 37. The last time I got it to compile was probably a few months ago, and some things had changed in the environment, in the overall operating environment. And so I needed to make some tweaks to the make file. And there was some small tweaks and I published those to GitHub. And so I just wanted to run the program here just to keep in mind the big picture of what I'm attempting to accomplish here, which is to um, run this program on multiple operating systems. So here's the program executing as it has been uh, successfully for the last, uh, last good while. And I'm going to take this program or the source code for this program and I'm going to have auto tools manage the, the construction of the, of the program from the source code. And so I got various pieces to this program and um, all of it is in a folder under the version 7 uh, directory tree called source. S-O-U-R-C-E. And then when I copy it over to the new version 8 folder tree, I'm going to rename that folder from S-O-U-R-C-E to S-R-C. S-R-C is more in line with the Linux software development conventions. And so I'm going to, uh, going to go with that. I'm also going to copy over the desktop files. These are the files that help um, integrate an icon into the um, into this desktop program, so that if there's um, integration with like the Linux menus, then the icons will uh, be be there in place. One of the things I want to look at is I want to look at the uh, the make file from versions version uh, seven, right? And 
while I'm putting this video together, I'm using the GNOME screen recorder, um, which is built into GNOME rather than OBS Studio, right? And I just wanted to try something different. And so um, the, the process actually froze up while I was recording this, which I found to be very interesting. So I cut my, my recording and I was able to get um, the make file open and here it is. This is the make file that um, was generated um, in version seven. I used bake file, which I talked about uh, extensively in the past. And this is the make file that uh, bake file generated, right? It's very close to the type of make file that you would write by hand. Um, since I no longer am using bake file, um, I did hand tailor this make file and I cleaned up a few things, right? And so um, that's nice uh, and all, but what we want to accomplish now is a new make file that's generated by Auto Tools. That's the ultimate objective. So now I'm in the version eight directory tree and I just renamed the source S-O-U-R-C-E uh, directory to SRC, right? I changed the name of the, of the folder. And so I also went in that folder and I deleted um, the external folder. Uh, the external folder had uh, the arg table source code. I don't need it anymore because I can get it automatically through, ta-da, the um, Fedora package management system, you see? So it makes it much easier to get these dependencies uh, in place, right? So I'm going to delete that, and that will, I can automatically pull that from the Fedora uh, environment. So that, that's going to be, be a nice, nice touch. And so I ran auto scan. So one of the first steps um, in the auto tools setup is to run auto scan from the command line window. And then what AutoScan does is it uh, goes through and it, it's like the name says, it scans through your directory tree to see what type of software files you're using. Is it C? Is it C++? And then it generates a file called configure.scan. The trick is you need to rename configure.scan to configure.ac. You got to do that yourself. Rename it to configure.ac. And once you've done that, now you have a autoconf compatible project. So with that one step, I now have auto tools. So now what I want to do is incorporate auto make. So I want to do that from the get go. The auto tools book, it takes you through a much longer step because it's looking at it from the standpoint of you already have an established software project where you put together a make file and now you want to convert that to auto tools. I'm kind of doing the same thing, but I'm also skipping the part where I try to make the make file that I have work with auto tools. I'm of the opinion here or of the position here. I'm just going to say, okay, I just want to go straight ahead to having auto tools manage the make file. So I'm not going to do all of those those intricate steps um, as outlined in the book. I'm going to go all the way from, I'm going to start, I'm starting at chapter one. I skip chapters two, three, four, and I'm going to skip to the chapter where it talks about auto make. So that's what I do here. And I do auto reconf dash I. So it goes through and it reads the configure.ac file, generates some other files, right? Needed for um, auto conf and auto make to work together. And then it gives me an error message um, at some point about um, it does not see a make file. It doesn't see anything in the um, configure.ac file that uh, denotes that um, there is a make file, right? And so what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to set up the initialization for auto make as indicated um, in the book um, Auto Tool Second Edition. And so I'm going to do am underscore init underscore auto make 
And then I'm going to uh, do something the book doesn't show, but based off of reading uh, it in the book, right? I'm just going to go ahead and put in parentheses, brackets, G-N-I-T-S. So GNITS, right? So that it gives me much more um, uh, strict warnings and error messages to make sure that the project is in full compliance. So uh, once I do all of that and I run it, um, I see that I got a number of files and I want to run auto um, reconf dash I just to um, see that everything is um, clean, right? So my goal is to be able to run auto, auto reconf dash I and have no error messages, right? And so I see I got one little more tweak to make, right? And so I got to identify that make file, which I'm going to add here. And you can actually just copy and paste from the error message and put um, that that statement in there, right? And so I like to type reset and keep my screen clear. And so I type auto reconf dash I and there are no more error messages uh, indicated. And so um, that's great. You'll notice I use touch to uh, create um, authors, uh, news, thanks, and a few other files. I do all that just on one command line, right? So, um, so everything is the way it needs to be um, from from a starting starting position, and then the next thing I want to do is start setting up a automake.am um, in a set of entries, right? So I set up the automake. Uh, .am file. This is the jewel of auto tools. This is the jewel of auto tools because setting this up means that your build gets uh, established automatically, right? So this is the, the auto in the make part, right? And so I'm following along in the book and I'm going to uh, set up my product variables, right? My product source variables. And it's a very cool concept, right? Um, everything that I'm talking about here is just like what you would see, would have seen in my videos when I was talking about bake file, or if you're using uh, Google's Mason, or you're using uh, CMake or anything like that, right? You are setting up your high level instructions, and these systems, whatever you're using, is going to turn those into a command line compile instructions that then uh, converts the source code into a software program. So we're several steps up in the abstraction, right? Um, and so this, this setup here with AutoMake, based on what I've read and what I'm, um, type, what I'm going to uh, type into the text editor here is much more high level than um, anything I've used. It's much more high level, or should I say, it's less granular, it's less detailed, right? So as long as you follow the patterns, it's actually faster in setting up a build. It's actually faster. Um, at least if, you're, if you're, um, your, your build is going to be pretty straightforward and not s super complex and complicated. But it has the... the, the it has to con the capability to go as complex as, as you need to, right, through uh, very advanced and in-depth uh, scripting, right? But for this project, I don't need that. And um, AutoMake is actually the right recipe for what I'm looking to achieve. Uh, the other great thing about, about this is it will allow me to do uh, cross compile to other operating systems using a single tool set. So that is um, a, a huge win as well. I'm actually going through these directories and I'm checking out a few things. Um, and I'm actually uh, wanting to uh, make sure I got all of my source code files uh, properly um, identified. I need to identify all of my source code files because that's what's going to go into this uh, automake.am file. So the automake.am file is going to create actual make files, makefile.in files, right? And so the source files have to be um, 
have to be correctly identified, right? And not they don't necessarily have to be identified in the, in the right order because Automake does a great job of, re, according to the book, I actually haven't tested it out yet, but according to the book, Automake is going to um, do a really good job of identifying the order of dependencies, which is a good time saver. It's not necessary for soft for someone who's uh, heavy into software development. We will make the dependencies work if we have to, right? Um, but um, here I wanted to find the main method, and it's in application.cpp. And so I'm also going to use a command line, um, pw, pwd, print working directory. And that is going to allow me to uh, get the uh, file path, the absolute file path uh, for the file. Um, and so I am going to paste that into um, the, into the makefile.am file. And I'm going to repeat that for each source implementation file, right? C++ implementation file in this particular case. Though it could be a C-sharp implementation file, a Java implementation file, a Python implementation file, you name it, right? So I'm going to, I'm going to uh, define all of those, right? And then I'm also going to have to um, set up the um, include directives, right? The include directives, same as I would as if I was uh, writing the compile uh, directives on the command line directly or in a script or in a make file, right? Um, you don't uh, actually get to um, um, avoid that. You still have to do that and know what that's about. And so um, by going through this process of traversing the directory tree, um, gathering this information, to set up the make file um, properly. And then uh, once I am done with this process, I will have I will have the minimum needed for this make file. It will not be a complete make file and it will not result in the program getting compiled, but it's how you begin the process of setting up a make file using AutoMake. At this point, I have all of the source code for the graphical user interface referenced in the AutoMake makefile.am file. And so this is going to allow AutoMake to pull in the relevant source code files to compile the user interface into a program. And so I'm going to um, run the autoreconf.i so it can run all the checks through AutoMake to see if the make file is properly formatted and properly defined. And so we do get a few diagnostic messages that we'll be able to use to improve and enhance the make file. At this point, I wanna look at the two different make files the one from version seven of the project and one from here in version eight. And as I scroll through the new make file generated by AutoMake, I see that it is far more extensive than anything a bake file could have generated. It has all kinds of checks, all kinds of uh, uh, functionality that will produce a more robust build of the software as I continue to use AutoMake and AutoConf and AutoTools well into the future.